speakers and all kinds of things because not everyone can hear or see that kind of reality. It requires a lot of sacrifice to do that. And the people who make those, those sacrifices are usually not just the ordinary lay people. You know, so, so the seers create their secret orders and they create structures that help human beings adjust socially to, to the requirements of society and they, they create laws. It's the religions that have always created the laws. You know, and Hegel points out that, that the Roman church is the perfect example of that. Uh, for, you know, for a thousand years in Europe, the church was responsible for law. And so this, the, the origin of the Christian inspiration is there behind and, and yet what the church becomes is in the developmental history of, of societies an institution for promulgating law primarily. Uh, social conventions and right and wrong and marriage and uh, the justification of hierarchy and all of those things that are necessary for human society to function. But that, that other s secret tradition is there behind. And it's inspiring. Throughout the whole history, it's inspiring. Um, people, a few people, usually. So then Hegel um, says some interesting things about all of this. Just to get a little introduction to the way his mind worked, and also he will help us define some of these uh, concepts. Can, can I ask you something, Mark? You know, the, this uh, saying comes up in my head when we've been talking about all this, and I wonder if that's sort of describing what this is about. It goes like, um, uh, life is empty and meaningless, and it's empty and meaningless that is empty and meaningless. Well, that's a kind of flat way to put it. <laughs> One dimensional. Yeah, but it's about that. <laughs> well, it's not really about that. No. But, uh, but that, uh, you can infer that. Listen a little bit more. Yeah. Because we, you know, the, the life is also that <coughs> highest divine Mahalakshmi. And so all of this life and death process, generation and corruption, as Plato puts it, is empty and meaningless unless you invest it with the awareness of that absolute good and beauty that is its essence. And so we get this whole <coughs> human history of philosophy about the difference between essence and what exists temporarily. And we get that philosophy because it's a correct way of defining things. Um, so it, it comes about when there's this recognition that the rational mind gets stuck on differentiating between generation and corruption and the purpose that generation and corruption serve and it, it creates this triangle of meaning and then it gets really exhausted by wars and famines and it says that all of this the content of this triangle is ultimately meaningless. Um, and then it says, after it rejects and renounces and steps back, it says, oh, wow, it's not meaningless. It's full of divine light. So there's a, this transition that has to take place between that realization of meaninglessness as a result of a lot of investment of meaning and attachment and, uh, you know, structures and values that ultimately collapse 
into meaninglessness. All those constructed uh, systems of understanding and valuation. So this process, you know, I, Hegel puts it like this. I think it's useful to us to hear this. In the practical domain, that's our everyday life, we have an other as object. All the things that we think are about objects. All the things that we talk about, things that we do, justifications for what we do, they're all objects that we speak about, think about, subjectively objectify. In religion, this object is God. Now, there is all of this that we've been talking about, the definitions of God, the emptiness, the absolute, the fullness, just concepts, basically. And if we have a little mystical inclination, then the concepts kind of resonate with something deeper in us. But basically we're talking about concepts. Inasmuch as human beings look back upon themselves, this object is an other for them, God. Something lying beyond them. In the theoretical domain, they do not reflect upon this antithesis. What is there is this immediate unity, immediate knowledge, faith. In the theoretical domain, they include themselves with this object. That is how we can express theoretical consciousness according to its conclusion. We are in that emptiness. We are temporal expressions of that absolute. We know it as a concept, and we are not different from it, theoretically. But we don't know it. So this is our dilemma. How do we transform this rational, consciousness of objects into a direct identity with the absolute divine beauty and power and truth which changes everything. So in Savitri she says, in just a few lines away from what I was reading, everything was the same but everything was different. So, Hegel says, and this is, the, this is the main point of today, the, the cultus, cultus, cult, cultus, the cultus, the cultus, involves giving oneself this supreme, absolute enjoyment. So he's, he's, he's adding on to the history of religion an element which is always there, which is the element of experience. And he calls it the cultus. And he gets it from Augustine. I have here a book of Augustine in which Augustine defines this term exactly. But he doesn't reference Augustine here. There is feeling within it. I take part in it with my particular subjective personality, knowing myself as this individual included in and with God, knowing myself within the truth, and I have my truth only in God, joining myself as myself in God together with myself. The action of the cultus. 
Now, the first form of the cultus is what is called devotion in general. Devotion is not the mere faith that God is, but is present when the faith becomes vivid. This is how Sri Aurobindo defines Shraddha. It's not, ordin it's not ordinary blind faith. It is the faith that is present in us with respect to the divine when it's a vivid, tangible touch. Now, how does it get to be that? When the subject is occupied with this content, not merely in objective fashion, but becomes immersed therein. The essential thing here is the fire and heat of devotion. The subject takes part in this way. It is subjectivity that possesses itself therein, that prays, speaks, passes through and beyond representations, knows itself and the object itself, and is concerned with its elevation. Devotion is the self-moving spirit. So this is um, practice. This is really spiritual practice. If you perform uh, devotional practice, if you chant the mantra, if you, if you sit quietly in the ray, if you um, um, generate the mantra, the Agni, Shakti, then you have something going on in you. And that kind of faith is faith in the possibility of that which is going on in you to liberate you. So it becomes tangible for a minute at least, maybe for an hour. Um, you engage with uh, a reality that gives you reason to believe that the beyond is here. That's then called sacrifice. To the cultus belong the external forms through which the feeling of reconciliation is brought forth in an external and sensible manner. As for instance, the fact that in the sacraments, reconciliation is brought into feeling, into the here and now of present and sensible consciousness, and all the manifold actions embraced under the heading of sacrifice that very negation about which our insight was that the subject rises above the finite and consciousness of the finite is now consciously accomplished. So if you sacrifice your sensational, rational thought, in the emptiness, through meditation. If you bring about that transition into absolute stillness by a practice, and Buddhism and Hinduism are full of those practices, you enter into the stillness, and in that stillness you feel all of the falsehood has been negated, and you're in the presence of the stillness. And if you dwell in that presence, it becomes infinite. You have a sense of the infinite in that stillness. And that's just one of many practices that Sri Aurobindo advocates. And he advocates it frequently in his writings. Silence the mind, silence the, the vital, enter into 
the stillness. And when you dwell in that, he says, you approximate the Brahman, because the Brahman is the absolute stillness of being. And it's ever present. But we don't sense it because we're sensing that vibration of the practical sensational mind all the time. But that self, soul, spirit in the witness and the wheel, that Brahman is there all the time, also behind. So when we perform that sacrifice of stepping back into the stillness, we are engaged in a kind of faith that is active. That's the action of faith. One more thing. Then he says, <coughs> The next stage, he says, negation exists within devotion and even maintains an outward configuration by means of sacrifice. The subject renounces something or negates something in relation to itself. It has possessions and divests itself of them in order to demonstrate that it is in earnest. Thus, from this negation, or from the sacrifice one advances, one advances to enjoyment, to consciousness of having posited oneself in unity with God by means of the negation. That's just what we heard in Savitri. Exactly what she did in Satyavan before his death. Um, this is Sri Aurobindo's fundamental teaching in Savitri. Through the negation, the absolute negation, one enters into the absolute pleroma, the identification with the divine, and then one can die consciously and pass through death to immortality. This is the teaching of Savitri. <clears throat> then he says, Hegel says, and this is important. Through this purification of one's heart, one raises oneself up to the realm of the purely spiritual. This experience of nothingness can be a bare condition or single experience, or it can be thoroughly elaborated in one's life. If heart and will are earnestly and thoroughly cultivated, cultus, for the universal and the true, then there is present what appears as ethical life. Then one can live selflessly for the welfare of all beings, as Buddhism teaches, because one has no more egoistic attachment to anything. So, devotion, sacrifice, ethical life. What was it that Panika told us? We have to define, religion always defines what we are and don't want to be, what we could be and will be, and how to move from one to the other. The fundamental structure of religion. And according to Hegel, it's more than that. He says, that is philosophy. Hegel. <laughs> so, the phenomenologist Father of Phenomenology says, this movement of the cultus is philosophy. It's going beyond the rational mind into identification with absolute spirit. And that brings about a transformation 
in the world, in the way one relates to the world. Ethical being, he calls it. Because that was the word in, the, in, in, in philosophy at that time, ethics. Good, the good. That's what Plato called the good. Sri Aurobindo calls it Superman. The good, the absolute good. The all creative, all knowing, absolute good. Superman. And you can, we can reach it through this pattern of behavior. There are aids that we can discuss later that are specific. Have another question? Um, yes. Um, it's about believing and having the faith. And then um, believing implies um, a rational activity. Mm -hmm. uh, we're still stuck to rationality. And then, um, you know, if we get into the cultus, um, it's like we don't really let go of that rationality. Well, well, Palikar said to us in the very beginning here, something which I've read a few times already in the last two weeks, if we accept the distinction between faith and belief... So how do you define faith? Faith is the <coughs> active engagement with the heat of the divine fire. So it's like an evidence which you... That, that is a tangible, aesthetic reality. Mm. And it destroys illusion. It burns it in the fire of sacrifice. So that's going to be the topic of our next hour. But first we have a break for tea.